encourage you to join us over the next several Fridays for these. Uh, for today's talk, we have Matt Trobiani joining us, developer of Hacknet. Hacknet was released on Steam in August last year, if that's correct. Um, it was incredibly successful and has an expansion coming out later on this year. Um, so, Matt's joining us to share some of the lessons he learned in releasing and marketing Hacknet for Steam. Thank you very much. All right, how's this mic volume? Uh, I can't <laughs> All right, I guess we'll just assume it's good. Um, yeah. Hey everyone, my name's Matt. I'm developer of Hacknet. Uh, yeah, um, so I would, thought I'd come here and talk a bit about uh, commercial viability and marketing and stuff. I actually prepared a talk for GCAP, which if you guys don't know is Games Connect Asia Pacific, um, to talk about a bunch of stuff that I learned and a bunch of stuff that I've been thinking about and, and the numbers that I got after I put out a game on Steam. And uh, I, I don't think I'm going to end up doing it, but the talk was originally called How to Make Lots of Money Selling Video Games on Steam, mostly because I was at GCAP the year before and there were lots of talks and I listened then to like watch a lot of talks about like how to make video games and like how to sell them. Um, I think the making ones are really interesting but less useful because everyone's making their own game so I'm not going to tell you how to do that but I'm going to try and talk to you a bit about the numbers and situations and markets and weird stuff that I ran into and the different way you have to think about things in order to address that sort of stuff successfully. Anyway, so I was at like, all these talks at GCAP and what I really wanted to know was like, how do you actually sell stuff? Like how does the market work behind the scenes and like how do you get press to write about you and how do you do all those complicated things that are outside of like your control it feels like. But it's definitely not really outside of your control. You just have to present yourself in a really good way. Uh, so first things first, I think I would just go over quickly how Steam actually works behind the scenes. Um, after I put out my game, um, I like went to PAX Prime in Seattle, and after that I went to the Valve dinner, which was really awesome. But when I was there, the table that I got seated at had this guy on it that actually wrote the algorithm that decides which games get put into the popular new releases list on Steam. Um, and that's a really, really important thing, like the difference between being on the new releases list and the popular new releases list, because popular new releases is like the default one on the page, is, uh, uh, I should probably have dug up some numbers, but I don't actually know because they're that wildly different. Um, for context, I actually put out another game on Steam independently before Hacknet, which was a colossal, disturbing failure. Um, and I'm not gonna tell you the name of that because I don't want anyone looking it up, but um, that was really interesting in that it went literally nowhere. Um, and the market's always getting harder, and then I put out Hacknet later and it did quite well. And I think it's interesting to like look at the, the two different situations and the two things that I did and the two games and see what worked and what didn't. Um, this is, yeah, so that sucked, but it also showed pretty clearly that you get absolutely no visibility at all, at all on like the new releases list but the amount of traffic you get through the popular new releases list is insane. So um, the front page of Steam is like where you want to be. There's this uh, thought in marketing uh, and marketing video games that what you want is to be maximizing um, the people that have seen your stuff, right? So like your whole goal is to get like a million eyes on it because if you get a million people to look at it, then a couple of thousand people are going to buy it and they're like, hey, you made a, you made a bunch of money, yay. And that's like, I think now that I've like seen all the numbers, that's the really wrong way to look at it. So Steam generates every like second, every day, so many paid views that you are not going to be able to like absorb it. Like your company will collapse before you get all of those sales converted into money, right? Like it's it's good. There are plenty of people out there, and there are people, plenty of people looking to buy video games. What you want is for like Steam to be doing the job for you of uh, making those games like making your game the one that all those people see so they can give you money and your job should be converting that into money um so basically like steam already valve already wants to do this they have this big storefront 
uh, and they want everyone that like looks at the storefront to spend money on the store. And all those people are there to spend money or looking for things that they'll want to buy. And what they want their products to do is to convert very well. So Hackneck got really lucky in that it converted at like a crazy high rate. I think we were converting at like 6%, which means that like 6% of people that like clicked on the store page um, like bought the game, which is ridiculous. And like, I don't know exactly how we did that. And I've got some like hints that will push you in the right direction a bit later, but like that's that was a lot and that was really good. Um, which meant that the quality of our traffic was really high. Um, the context, as far as I know, the average conversion rate is sits around like one and a half to two percent. It might drop down to one percent already. I'm not sure, but that that drops over time. Um, but that means that from Valve's perspective, they can put like a, a very and because they have all of the data for this entire process, they can put a very comfortably reliable number on how much it gains them to like click on your store page. So they know for a fact about how many store page clicks per second they get, and they can fill their front store page with the tiles that make them the most money to click on. So for example, my game was up for $10 and I was converting at like 6%, right? So Valve makes, um, it's under NDA, so I can't give exact numbers, but they make like somewhere between 20 and 40% of the sales of every game on Steam. Um, and that's, that's a pretty normal industry standard. So let's average that and say they earn roughly 30% um, of that amount of money, like per click. So 6% uh, of $10 is like 60 cents. And then they earn like 30% of that. Yeah, I yeah, know, it's especially, it's hard. 18 cents. 18 cents. 18 cents. It's 18 cents. No, thanks, Alex. Um, yeah, and then so they earn like 30% of that. So like for each time someone, like, and you should, you should probably realize that for a price per click, I don't know if you guys looked into advertising, but they're earning like a lot off of that. Um, and Valve generates clicks on their storefront at a rate you wouldn't believe, which means that like they can calculate exactly how much everyone makes them. And they have a couple of other metrics too, but that's like a really important one because one of the things I learned uh, sitting at that Valve dinner with the person that writes this algorithm is that customer satisfaction maps to the amount of money they're spending pretty well so that you can actually just make them spend more money and they will be happier. And they're like, this seems really weird and exploitative, but like we ran all the numbers and this is the way that everyone was happiness, which is also happened to the way that we were making almost the most amount of money, which works out really well for them. Um, but it also makes our calculations a whole bunch easier because uh, again, it's about converting well. So it's not just about, um, how much your game costs as well. You might think that if you charge double the amount and then you convert at the same rate, then you're gonna earn double the amount of money. And that's true, that'll definitely help you stay on that popular new releases list longer. Um, they also have a reasonably strong bias towards rotating out things that are new and interesting or people that are, um, like pe when people are buying like in bulk, right? So if, if two people buy um, a game that's half the price of one sale, that's slightly better for your like um, algorithm placement than um, like just the one sale of a lot of money, right? Um, because that generates like buzz. Again, like the people on the storefront are happier when they're spending money. So they want like as many people as possible to be spending money on things as possible at any time. You get the idea. Uh, what this all comes down to for your end is that you need to be converting customers when they do get to your page really well. Now, unfortunately, just making a really good Steam store page doesn't seem to have very much effect on that at all. Um, the Steam store page itself doesn't really matter because people have probably decided if they want to buy it or not just from the title and the little image on the side alone. And past that, your trailer is actually really important. So how do we get better conversions? Um, I'll get into that in a second, but uh, let's talk some numbers about the difference here and like how many opportunities you have to convert well before you start disappearing into like the goop that is the failed Steam games. Um, and that, that goop is extensive and it's like pulling you in at every point in time. And basically you have like one week-ish, but really it's like, really it's like two and a half days to like prove to Valve that you're going to be profitable. So uh, they give everyone that releases on the Steam store page 
about 100,000 impressions. 100,000 to a million, but um, be conservative and just say you're gonna get 100,000-ish impressions. And that is, uh, I'm not actually sure exactly where they all come from, but I think it's mostly the people that actually click on the new tab instead of the popular new releases tab. And you're gonna be on that tab for about 100,000 views of the entire page, not clicks on yours or anything. They can't afford that. Um, about 100,000 views of the page before you just get like pushed off into nothingness. And you need to convert as many of those 100,000 page views into clicks on your store page, which then converts into sales on your game as possible. Because if you're not beating the people above and below you on that list, you're not gonna be in the popular new releases tab and they are. Um, and if you're on that like popular new releases tab for like 20 seconds, it's fine. You've outsold everything in you. Uh, it's a really big deal. But you need to be converting those people uh, from the new tab to push you in there at like the first available point and then there's like a slightly different game, which is, it works in almost the same way, but basically like on the popular new releases tab, you're then competing against the global market, not just things that were released that week, but that's hard. Once, you've, once you're on the popular new releases tab, you've made it in some capacity, right? And then it's a fight to get onto the top sellers thing and to stay in the carousel forever. Um, and you wanna be looking into those, but you really need to pay a lot of attention to how you convert that first 100,000 block of people to view your game. Um, the problem is this is a completely random subset of 100,000 people from the world that happen to have opened Steam like over those two-ish days, maybe less depending on like how much stuff's coming out, um, which again, release in a good time so that you get three days and a couple of hours out of that before you get pushed off of that list because your performance on the list is really important. Basically, you've got one shot with a lot of people will see your game in some capacity and you have to convert as much money and positive traffic out of that, which includes positive reviews and things, that sort of thing biases your score to, um, as possible, preferably within the first couple of hours, because the better you do within your release window, the more likely it is that Valve will feature you again, because you've been able to prove yourself, right? So, if you do well within the first couple of hours, that will like push you up to this like Oops, that'll push you up to this level of profitability by which they can say, um, oh, we can like put you in one of those uh, midweek madness sales slots, which has the like the big pop-up at the start and then in the top right corner. Um, those are like really valuable, like absurdly valuable, and you can't buy them. If you could, I'd drop a hundred thousand US dollars on that in like a blink of an eye. They are absurd. Um, and the amount of like traffic and attention and like profitability you get out of them is like a really big deal and they are literally giving them away on a weekly basis to anyone that's proven themselves and that's rotating like out that proved that they could convert very well because they generate a lot of clicks and if you've proved that you can't convert those clicks into a lot of money they've literally thrown away that hundred thousand dollars and they're a company and they cannot afford to well they can but they don't want to afford to do that um, so it's really important that you like make the most of your first chance um, which brings us to the second really upsetting point, that there's this like ongoing idea within indie games that your first week is your most profitable time, and that is literally only true if your game is a huge failure. And that's, it's like sad, but that means that you haven't proven yourself enough that they're willing to feature you again in the future. Because you have like years, preferably, depending on your game, probably years, of like follow one time after it's released, in order to like be visible again, be on the front page again, Steam sales are a really big deal, and developers make like a lot of their sales off of it. Like we make so much more money whenever we like put any amount of discount on the game, just because it drives traffic to it. Um, and that traffic is really important. And Valve has that traffic to give away for free, and they will give you enough to make you all of the sales you want and need, as long as you can guarantee them that they'll make money off of sending those people to you. Okay, so this comes down, like, it's all about like learn to kick sales in your game, convert really well. This like doesn't stay on very well. Uh, can you check the volume on that? Yeah. Yeah, so this all comes down to like convert really well. So how do we do that? Um, the first 100,000 people that will see your game are the most important ones, so let's talk about those first. Uh, your trailer needs to be really good. 
um, like really good and really interesting and you want to have built a community around that so that those people will in the first eight hours deliberately go to steam just to find your game and if it's not in that list they'll type it into search which is bonus points for steam's algorithm um and they'll buy it for sure which means that like if you're converting it like uh like a one percent or two percent rate they're the equivalent of like hundreds of people worth of traffic each um they're really important so you want to have people that are excited about your game this is the value of hype and there's this people that will buy it before looking at reviews or anything um, and they make your initial conversion rate really good. Um, so to do that, you need one, a really awesome trailer, and really awesome trailer goes a lot further because it also biases media, which is the second thing you need, which is media retention. Um, media retention's really hard and is a huge, really long other talk and degree and like lifetime of study that I haven't actually done. Um, there are like media experts in games and a lot of them I don't know if they know what they're talking about um, there are people that do talks and I think they might be the best experts or they might have no idea and it's a really weird and difficult um, like thing to get into but if we're going to talk about interacting with games media and how to get written about um, there are a couple of things that we can sort of like reduce down to axioms and like work up from there so um, we're going to go with the first assumption is uh, people don't want to read the same thing twice. It doesn't matter how long between your like announcements you announce it. If you announce the same thing, people don't care the second time. Um, and people want to see like a something uh, new and interesting. Basically, they won't read an article if there's nothing new and interesting about the article as a whole. You can't trick the game's media into getting their most charismatic writer on it to just write like a page of bullshit and then plug your game at the end because that makes their job really, really difficult. And media are people too. So it's important to realize that like, if you want someone to write an article about your game, you need to have basically already written it for them. Um, like another embarrassing truth about the games and media thing is that when you send out your press releases, you want to have a bunch of dot points, which are like the witty one-liners to dump at the end of there so they can copy and paste a series of them and scatter them throughout the article to make theirs look unique. Um, good journalists and stuff don't do this, but you want to be doing their entire job for them. If you've ever seen like a games journalist's email inbox, it's like a horrifying sight, like especially if you see them interacting with it, because it will just be like pages and pages of being like, I've made the greatest Steam game ever, contained key within, please check out, right? And that's like the most useless subject line ever for them because, and they will go down their inbox and they'll like click the little boxes on the left of everything and then click next page because it saves them and then they'll just click delete all because they don't care at all and they don't have time to read a thousand emails a day from all of that. So you need to like give them, make their job really easy because they want to write like good articles that are going to generate clicks because that's how they get fed and paid. Um, usually paid before fed. but. Um, yeah, you want to like make their job really easy. So like you can put your clickbait in the subject line and if they didn't clickbait it, then your clickbait wasn't good enough because unfortunately at this point in the games industry, you also need to be a marketing expert as well um, to be able to do that. So talk to people about it, um, which takes us back to like the uh, axioms we were talking about. Uh, you want to make sure your releases, whenever you contact the media, it should have an article within it that you would be okay with reading. Like if you if you like write down the dot points about what you're announcing and what you're showing, and then you try and write out like an engaging article that you think would drive clicks to the world's biggest gaming website or whatever website you're trying to get it on, and you can't write that article because the, you've there's nothing there, then they're not going to either. Like it doesn't matter how good they are at turning nothing into something, they don't wanna have to do that if they have a thousand other emails in their inbox that have really good stuff in it that they can just copy and paste into an article and throw the trailer at the top of and be like, hey, look at this cool thing that was announced today. If you have announced like, like, oh, we're going to launch our trailer on this date, no one cares. Like, and that's, that's unfortunate, but it's not really because if you look at the actual websites that you want to be written about on, like have a look at the articles that are on there and produce like your own set of like release information that could produce an article like that interesting. Uh, you're probably gonna note that a lot of the bigger games on those websites can like 
they can say literally nothing, like a red star, uh, like rock star can release like a red box and everyone loses their minds, right? But you're not, you're not going to get away with doing that. Um, it's because they have like a really good pedigree of uh, releasing really good stuff and that like box implies a lot. Don't, don't try any fancy shit like that. Like the more you're doubting the quality of the like material you're sending to the media, like put more in it. Like uh, compress your like uh, your like number of like spikes that you're sending out. So um, I had a good word for this, but I've forgotten it now. Anyway, you want to like approach the media in like a couple of waves with like a few chunks of information. So one's going to be like you announce the game and you have a bunch of screenshots. Say this is what it's about. Um, and another one is like oh here's like the uh, the pre-release trailer or like the hype trailer. Another one is the game's come out, like here's where you can buy it, here's what it's about, here's what you can do. Um, and then you can like scatter some other stuff in the middle of it if you want, like oh here's some first gameplay um, and all of that. But like basically the better the quality of media retention you get from the first time you contact press, the more you can get away with announcing less. Because uh, media work in a similar way to Steam in that they're going to gauge how well their audience responds to the content you've given them. So uh, I got really lucky with um, like Hacknet because the word hacking was like so hot right then. Uh, and it still is now and it's like a very lucky topic because they can be like, oh look, there's all these computer hackers that are breaking into all of our national security, vote Trump. And they'd like, uh, and they're like, it just generated a million clicks and it was great. Um, so then I could like get away with announcing less and I didn't take advantage of that and maybe I should have. And that's, that's not a huge loss. Um, but if I'd like, if I just sent these people like an email with a lot less than I did the first time the game was announced, they might not have written about it at all. And like, or the ones that did would have like, like not had much to work with and then they would have seen their, their communities response to it to be less and then so they're less likely to write about it again in the future. So you want the first contact you have with press about your game to be something punchy and good because you want to produce a reaction. Um, getting in contact with the press at all is hard which is part of the reason why you go to conventions, you meet them in person and then you get their Twitter handles and then when you send them an email you send them a thing on Twitter being like hey I emailed you and they're going to see that on Twitter because everyone looks at their Twitter and then they're going to feel a little bit guilty about deleting yours too which gives you like a thousand percent chance of getting through it. Yeah, so that's super sneaky. Uh, don't abuse that because if they ever feel like you're treating them badly, they're just not going to write about you and they're going to delete your emails because they have a lot of other shit to take care of. Um, I think the big takeaway from this is be very conscious about the fact that the media have a job to do. You want to make their job as easy as possible um, so that they can produce a really interesting and awesome article with like absolutely no effort um, because of how good you're like press release or press push for that particular wave was. And that's how you get written about. Um, treat them with respect, don't send them crap. Um, understand that their emails and their like traffic is absolutely insane and like exhausting to go through. Um, and like try and filter and look through the lists to people that will actually give a shit about it. Uh, and treat, treat them with like respect and be very conscious of like uh, how they're going to do it. And that's how you get articles written about you. Um, unfortunately, with everything I've been saying, it requires that you make a really good game first. But I'm just gonna go right ahead and assume that you're doing that because you know if you're making a terrible game, then none of this matters anyways. So, you know. um, if uh, there are ways to check if your game is going to do all right and how your media materials are going, um, and they're actually really easy to think of. Um, and the only reason you probably haven't done them already is because you're scared of finding out that your current strategy is not market viable. Um, this is something you should probably admit to yourself as early as possible because it's going to have a huge effect on the marketability of your game. Uh, and it takes a couple of minutes and there's no reason why you're not doing it right now, except for the fact that it's really emotionally exhausting and difficult. Um, you should own that about yourself. And if you are doing that, that's fine. But that is the point at which you hire a publisher or you hire someone else to take that responsibility for you, uh, from you. Because they don't care that much if your game fails. I mean, they, they care, but like, they haven't been working on it for three years. To them, it's like they're taking a gamble. Um, and if you can't get a publisher, find someone that you trust and get them to 
uh, do some of these things for you. Um, now the obvious one is you take a screenshot of the front page of Steam, you Photoshop your little game's name into it and your little like icon, and then you show it to people and you see if they pick it out as being the most interesting one on that list or like the most engaging one. Um, you Photoshop your own like stuff into like a, like the Steam templates and you see if it works. Uh, you like write up these articles that I've been saying about like that you, you would want to see on whatever website that you want to see it on. Like make a big list of exactly like your dream email being like, oh hey, um, you were written about on these websites. Like go to them all, write the exact article that you'd see there and like see if it would actually fit. See if it's really hard to write that article because it probably will be. Um, at which point you need to decide that you might want to compress and do less pushes to the media with more content in them um, or expand a bit, which is very rare. But um, usually compressing is better because they have a lot of work to do. Uh, for example, with Hacknet's media push, we decided to compress almost entirely into two pushes instead of like 10, which meant that our announcement and our pre-release trailer and all of the details of the game came out at the exact same time in that one email that came out about three weeks before the game's launch. Uh, which means that three weeks before the game's launch, we got a lot of media attention, um, a lot of uh, like views on the trailer, uh, and a lot of people talking about it, which was about the exact right amount so that when we got released on Steam, there were a big chunk of people within that 100,000 people that viewed it that like went through to click on the game. And a lot of those people like had already seen the trailer and had already read about it and like everything on the Steam page was built to reinforce those ideas and that like um, that thing that we were selling, right? Which was like the you are a hacker thing. Um, and being consistent with your like messaging is really important. Being aggressively honest with your messaging is really important. Like um, Assault Android Characters had a really good example of this where they had uh, like a their trailer said like local multiplayer right and but because they didn't explicitly after this said seriously though no online multiplayer like their community hated them but if their trailer had the words local multiplayer but seriously not online really we can't be bothered making that they would have loved them for it and it's really weird because the only thing that steam users enjoy shitting on more than developers is other Steam users. So if they can have someone that like calls them a dumbass for not seeing this incredibly obvious message that it wasn't going to be in there, they'll hate on each other instead of you. And that makes it look like from the outside that they're all fighting for you, which is much nicer. Um, so be really like aggressively honest with your like um, messaging. Uh, so those are like your first two steps for like converting really well. You need to put out a trailer. And if you can have a trailer that has 100,000 views on it on YouTube, before launch, that is very good. <laughs> um, like that's about what you should be aiming for, like uh, on your marketing efforts, because you don't have much other like measurable stuff. Um, the main measure of how well your marketing's going and how well your media pushes are going is going to be measured by trailer views. And if you get over the twenty thousand view mark, those are start you're going to start rapidly approaching converting one YouTube view to one sale, um, which is crazy. Uh, that's for your first month, by the way, not lifetime. Um, like a lot of those websites that I was talking about, um, I did some of this stuff with Hacknet stuff, and uh, like one website drove twenty thousand views to the trailer, and that's that, right? Games, games gonna do well because everyone that's watched your trailer beforehand has an enormous chance of clicking on the actual tile on the game when they see it pop up on Steam. Um, if you can work some like subtle story stuff and uh, think about like human psychology and like what people like to come back to or what pe makes people curious, and if you can hint that there's going to be like something, some more information on the Steam page, even if they're not interested in the game at all, like that they can't turn that off and they will probably go to the Steam page anyway, which uh, helps your like um, ratings a lot. Although if you're tricking people into going to your Steam page, they definitely aren't going to buy it. That hurts your conversion rate, which sucks. Bring a lot of people to the Steam page; it'll be fine. Um, yeah, you want 100,000 views on your trailer. If you don't know how to do that, start talking to people that do. If no one knows how to do that, start calling up publishers. Um, you need to do a lot of research. Um, and it's really difficult, but that's like a really good measurable goal. Um, because the more views you get on that, the more that's going to convert into like conversions. 
and awareness. People are much more likely to click on your tile if they've heard about it earlier, even if they've heard about it in a negative context, than if they're just seeing it out of the blue. Like, the, the actual little image and the name doesn't really convert anyone. No one cares. They have to have heard about it in some capacity beforehand. Um, unfortunately, all this means that marketing on Twitter and Facebook is basically useless because everyone that follows you is a game developer or a family and friend, and they're going to buy it anyway. Forget about it. Um, until you have 100,000 followers on Twitter, it doesn't matter. It's nice to making a little devlog. It's nice to have like the game developer community like retweet you and stuff. All of their followers are like developers too. Yeah. Um, marketing's really hard, and it's not going to be as easy as tweeting a bunch. If your blog gets 100 views a month, those people already like your game. They're already going to buy it. Like, um, just doing things for the sake of doing them is like the wrong way of thinking about it. This is a solvable problem that you can reduce down to like very basic, very understandable, very testable ideas, and you should be doing that. Uh, it's pretty obvious that like if your Twitter account with a thousand users is your main form of marketing the game, then your market saturation is a thousand users and your game is going to die. Like that's, that's the unfortunate reality. So like start thinking about the problem really critically because there are answers. Questions? Yeah, so uh, I'll get a bit closer to the microphone. Uh, sure. Tell it to my visible on the screen. Yeah. Alrighty. So uh, first question from when we were talking before the presentation, mm -hmm. you said that there were a few things that you'd like to do differently if you did it over again. So uh, what kind of things would they be? Yeah, I'm really sorry to do this to you. That question was like a massive bait. Um, uh, basically, <laughs> it's uh, I wanted to talk about the way in which that's the exact wrong question to ask. Um, because all of the things that I would have done differently were clearly manageable errors that still put me in this position like that's really good. I could have done stuff a lot differently and maybe done even better, but who, that's like such an obnoxious thing to say. Like, well, the what about what did you do differently with your, your first game, which didn't go so well, and then Agnet? That yeah, well. so, that's, so that, that is the right question. Um, unfortunately, those games are so different that it doesn't compare very well. Um, I think the way you should be looking at it is to form like a like a, a model of what a success looks like and what a failure looks like um, in two games that are as close in genre and in like uh, approach to the market as possible and then sort of like diff them, right? Uh, you work out what did differently and then you like quiz like both people on like the, uh, the points of difference and the choices they made there and to find that out. Um, the thing that went poorly in my first game is that like my marketing was bad like the only the first time anyone saw my like good trailer for it was on the Steam page, which is already too late because nobody's clicking on that Steam tile without having already seen the trailer. Um, I was never going to convert well because it was never written about beforehand. Like the first exposure for the game and the entirety of that exposure period was like on the store page new section, and then people wrote about it afterwards, but it had already slipped off that list. Like you need people to know about the game before it goes onto Steam. In fact, I think the trailer that you put out three weeks before the game comes out on Steam is a lot more important than your release date trailer. In fact, it was the same one for Hacknet because we made a new one for release day and then it was just slightly worse and we were like, eh, who cares? Doesn't matter. And it didn't matter. Like the trailer that comes out three weeks before is important. Um, but yeah, asking like what I would do differently is like, it's like an interesting question, but it's probably more important to ask um, to look at other, like a uh, failure that was in the same genre or in the same like market scope. So I was in like something relatively niche. Um, and to look at where they failed and where I succeeded and what we did differently. Yep. Um, yeah, because mine worked out. So I wouldn't do it that differently. Cool, so you were just mentioning the trailer. Um, I personally think you had a really good trailer, Thanks. especially that pre-release trailer. Yep. What do you think worked so well about that trailer? Uh, music is really important. Um, and like I happen to have really awesome artists on the soundtrack. Um, I paid a lot of attention to storyboarding and there's a lot of psychology that goes into it. Um, if you guys have made like a bunch of game jam games and the first time you make a game that has like a story in it, even if your story is terrible, stories are OP, man. Like they're like, they just like grip people by the throat. And even if it's like, even if it's the dumbest thing ever, if you tell them there's like a mystery at the end of it, they'll finish that game. Um, and so like working elements of that knowledge into the trailer building process um, by like adding some like some mystery and weirdness to it um, yeah. like really helped a lot yeah. um, because it got people talking about like 
uh, and thinking about like the game in this context of which there's like a, a lot to explore and the things that they want to find out that like you don't tell them the whole story by the way just like give them like three or four bits and pieces and be like there's some mysterious stuff going on you gotta visit the steam page like um yeah so uh catching on elements like that is like really valuable um being like super honest and funny about like what the gameplay was and making it just seem very hackery and then like throwing in a couple of in jokes um for people that that would like bait people into wanting to like comment on it like um the like the replace HTML command would like trick people into like, not trick people, but it was meant to be there for the sort of people that would do that in game or the sort of people that would talk shit about it being like, hey, just replacing basic HTML, I could do this. And then they'll start a big debate with themselves and they'll all get super excited about it because it could be anything because they don't know because what's going on in the story. Um, yeah, you want to make people curious. Um, you want to make people excited um, and you want to show really aggressively um, and I keep using that word to describe your messaging, but like, don't be shy about like saying what it is and definitely don't be shy about saying what it isn't because um, if you don't, people are gonna start asking questions. And if they say, does the game have this? And you have to say no, they get disappointed. But if you say in a trailer, like it has this and this and it definitely doesn't have this, that makes it sound like it was like a bold, brave design decision that you're heroic for making for some reason. So do that in your trailer. Cool. So uh, next question. Mm -hmm. You've talked about approaching Steam and about media. Mm -hmm. um, you've also mentioned the importance of publishers. So mm -hmm. do you have anything to say about how to approach them? Uh, I have a bunch to say about publishers. Approaching them is a weird, interesting thing. I sent out a whole bunch of emails. Um, do your research. There are a bunch of publishers out there and most of them are going to say no to you and that's fine. Like you don't lose anything for that. In fact, you gain a whole bunch. Um, like now I'm friends with a bunch of them because we'd had contact before and we spoke afterwards. Um, and it was good. And that gives you like access to emailing a bunch of their developers for advice and stuff. And everyone's really friendly. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna be obnoxious about it. My main suggestion for getting published is win some awards because that makes it easier. Um, which the first step to is making a really good video game. Um, finding a publisher if you have a sufficiently good game um, to, like, to make money isn't that hard because they're really interested in signing on and doing literally no work and taking a bunch of that money. Um, it's going to be largely your responsibility to like make the game successful in the first place. Um, and this is the pessimistic way of looking at publishers, by the way. Um, but again, you are only going to make the bulk of your money in that first week if you are a failure anyway. They're not going to help enormously with your release week aside from giving you some advice. It's still your job. Um, and they might give you that advice without signing with them. Uh, so like, definitely get in touch with a bunch of those people and sign with them if it's gonna be worth it because, uh, okay, so you've got three cases. One is like, uh, you were going to be successful anyway and you signed with them and they didn't do anything and now you're successful, it's great. Um, you were not gonna be successful, this case number two is you were not gonna be successful and their small amount of influence they're going to change over your release week has made you successful. That's an obvious win. Uh, three is you weren't gonna be successful anyway um, and they didn't change anything and you failed at any point. Um, yeah, it like basically like those cases all work out that like in case one, which is your most likely case if they're doing that in the pessimistic world, uh, at which point you can have them working for like a period of years, like getting you Steam deals and um, like uh, marketing for you and finding opportunities for you by which they will pay for themselves. I can say that from experience. Um, like my publisher didn't help a lot with release week, like very much. They were, they were really helpful to have them there, but they didn't um, make any big earth shattering moves that like changed how the market like approached it or anything. It was like, um, like I worked out all the marketing things. I like, like wrote the trailer and stuff. Um, and they're not gonna like pay for stuff but they've paid for themselves like dozens of times over afterwards by like getting a bunch of those midweek madness deals on Steam and doing that. So um, in terms of approaching publishers, like you were asking, uh, send them a bunch of emails, have a really good product for them um, and like outline some of your media, like your marketing plan and stuff, which you do need to work out on your own. Like people aren't gonna take this job for you unless you pay them to, um, or you pay the publisher in like uh, royalties to do it for you, but they are going to do a worse job because they don't know your game nearly as well as you do. 
Um, send them a bunch of emails. Um, ideally, win some awards first. That's helpful. Um, but yeah, be really conscious about um, what a publisher can do to you, do for you. Um, some like uh, Devolver and um, Tiny Build will just like take over your life in a really positive way. Um, and I've spoken to a bunch of people that have signed with both of them. They're really good. Um, surprise tax much smaller, and they'll have like a like a subtler touch. But they've done excellent work for me, and I don't regret signing with them at all. Fantastic. Um, so next up, you were mentioning uh, making sure that you have a quality product before you go to a publisher. How far along in development do you think you should be? Uh, it depends if you're going to a publisher to look for funding or you're going there to look for release assistance. Um, I started talking to my publisher about six months before, but I thought I was about three months out and it was just for like um, to get their help with marketing in the release window, um, not for like funding at all, and I didn't accept any money for that. Um, there is actually a whole bunch of money out there, uh, especially in VR at the moment, um, that you can get uh, publisher funding with. I wouldn't recommend it if there's any way you can get funding outside of that, but um, it is an option. If you need money, talk to publishers, they might be able to help you out. Otherwise, uh, six-ish months beforehand, but um, and like get stuff signed a couple of months beforehand, then don't expect them to really do much until about two months out, at which point you're starting your media roll-up stuff, because they don't actually have anything to do before then. Cool, so uh, last question, at mm -hmm. least that's coming so far. When contacting media for the first time, do you think there's a word limit? Because you're saying making sure that the message is short and punchy. Yep. Um, I don't have a number for you, but like, don't waste their time. And that's super critical, right? Like, if they get bored reading your announcement email, their readers are going to get bored reading the dumb article they produce out of it. Um, so they know that writing that article would be a mistake. Um, they need to get those clicks. They need people to like their stuff. Um, they need to get paid. Um, so if they're bored reading your email, you're already done. Um, like compact it as much as possible, and give them as much information as they want or they like need, or just like give them like a couple of dot points and an overview, and send them like a full link to like a do press kit page um, with more information if they need it, because then they can write their article and then they can just go to that page and pull out a couple of quotes and stuff, um, which is a pretty good way of doing it. Because uh, then they don't actually need to interview you. As nice as it is being like interviewed when you haven't done it before, like it takes a long time, and they don't have time to do that for everyone. So if you have a bunch of stuff ready for them, um, that helps a lot. Um, yeah. So I'd say keep it super brief. Uh, really think about what you're writing to them and like how you're sending it. Um, ideally, send personalized ones, but that's an exhausting, slow process. Um, if you can, go to a convention, meet them in person first. Um, and like form some like connections with your media. Um, this is the problem Gamergate was talking about, but we're just going to go with it. Um, like you want to form a connection with them, so like they know who you are and like that you're really serious and really care about your game, because that makes it more likely they'll read your email. Um, like contact them in a way that's like very uh, easy to process, like Twitter, to um, like gauge interest or send them something. Don't flood them; it's so obnoxious. Um, yeah, but. Uh, Go about tastefully, think very carefully before you send those emails because uh, they're your lifeline to that 100,000 views and commercial success. Excellent. Thank you very much cool. for joining us. Thank you.